Hello and welcome to this brand new series of Rewirement, the podcast where we help you make the right connections to create your brightest financial future, brought to you by Legal and General. I'm Angelica Bell and over the next eight shows, I'm going to be meeting a whole range of people wrestling with real financial issues from how do I buy my very first home to can I retire at 50? We've searched up and down the country for those willing to share their stories and we found a team of fantastic financial experts all ready to help them get where they want to go. Now each time you're going to hear what happens when the person with the questions meets the person with the answers and we hope you'll learn a whole load of useful tips along the way wherever you are in your financial journey. Today we're actually meeting two people but they share a story. Amy and Dan are both in their 30s. They're married to each other and they have a beautiful two-year-old daughter called Maya and live in South Wales and they are joining me now. Lovely to chat to you both. How are you? Yeah, very good, thank you. Good, thank you. Now, before we get to where you're going on the financial front, tell me a bit more about where you've come from because you've got quite a story to tell, isn't that right? Yeah, a bit of a financial roller coaster, I guess, <laughs> is our story. <laughs> We've been together 10 years and about sort of two, three years into our relationship, I knew Dan had a bit of credit card debt and basically got to that point where we were just about to buy our first house. And I think Dan had a natural panic and confessed that actually his debt was quite a bit more than he had told me. <laughs> he basically had more debt than he was earning in his annual salary. Right. Okay, that must have been quite a shock for you. It'd be interesting to know how you found yourself in that situation because it does happen to lots of people, although they don't speak about it. I'll be really honest, I didn't realise the situation until the panic set in. Debt can be built up in so many different ways and with me, it was just overspending on literally nothing and that was the worst part about it was when you realised actually how much debt I was in, there was literally nothing to show for it. I'd hit the point. I guess I needed some help. I needed to get out of that situation, and like, and I wasn't being honest with Amy was the bigger part, and that, and mm-hmm. I guess that was the, that was the bit that was, yeah, really eating me. So, do you think before that you weren't being honest with yourself, maybe burying your head in the sand, thinking this will just go away, or oh, a hundred percent. For me, I felt that I was trying my best to get out of debt, so making payments to clear credit cards and things like that, and then doing it in such a bad way that you realise you get to few weeks before payday and you've got no money in your account again mm-hmm. so the only thing that you can then do is is spend on a credit card again this becomes this vicious cycle yeah. i had credit cards that i had forgotten about i was making payments on them because there was a direct debit oh goodness, set up really i'd almost blocked it from my mind because i hadn't sat down and looked at it all in, in any kind of detail well we know that debt and financial problems can bring on anxiety depression it can ruin relationships, but obviously love conquers all in this one because, <laughs> Amy, you didn't run. I didn't. I think the first bit I'd say is talking to somebody and Dan absolutely hated talking to obviously come and clean with me. But my next step was I want you to tell some of your family and some of our close friends because I don't want to be in this on my own. I want right. other people to know that this is what we're dealing with, that this is what I'm having to deal with yeah. and, and help you with. And I think that was really important for us. And I don't know that we'd have done it without mm. some of that friend and family moral support, if not, if not financial support. Would you agree, Dan, with that? Oh, totally. I'm now at the stage where it's it's much easier for me to talk about any of it. But at the time, the anxiety that came with it and the guilt and the shame and the pride all kick in together. And that's where part of that burying your head comes from is because you're too ashamed to even look at it yourself to understand how have you got yourself into this position. You know, you talking about it will help somebody else and they will go on to help somebody else. And I think that's what you should take heart from. And also financial management doesn't come easy to some people and there's nothing wrong with that. So, Amy, do you want to tell me about the list of things you did to help you get back on track? (laughs) Yeah, there's all the traditional ones where we took a jam jar approach to our finances. We said, all right, how much do we think is fair to spend on going out for drinks and dinners and stuff? And you say, all right, that's that money. And and when that's gone, that's gone. The other bit was, how do we make a bit more money? How do we try and clear this debt down faster? We realised the car was costing us a ton. It wasn't like we had a fancy car. It was actually the opposite. So we were spending loads on repairs and insurance. So we got rid of the car and that meant we had a free parking space. So I rented out our parking space and <laughs> let someone else in the building have it. We ended up renting a room to my brother for nearly a year. That really helped. Yeah. I am a massive like couponer now. So we would have a club card and we use club card points or Morrison's points or Nectar points. And they would get saved up for Christmas and presents when you needed them or new decorations. And 
and I don't know how many times I changed our current account that year. We made at least a thousand pounds changing current accounts. Any kind of new subscription offers, because I liked my wine. So I would sign up to those like, you know, naked wine type offers and we would get a little crate of wine and that would be my month's supply of wine. And then I'd unsubscribe and we'd get another offer. (laughs) I love this. Dan, you're literally, you're just sitting there going, yep, she did this, she did that. I mean, that's incredible. I mean, it was it was amazing, right? And I mean, I was I hope she's still with me. I'll do whatever she tells me to do. Um, <laughs> Stinge. Um, <laughs> look, and we're ten years on, and I still don't know how that's happened, right? But the way that Amy's managed to steer us in that way was was absolutely incredible. I think at one point I even did mystery shopping on my lunch break. I was like, if I'm going to browse the shops, I may as well get paid for it. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! I mean, your story is inspiring and one thing I say to people about their finances is it, it's a continually changing thing to navigate so what are the main questions you're looking to find answers for right now? Yeah that's it so we've we've kind of come through all of that side of it we've now bought our family home we've done the maternity leave and saved for that and we've kept all those spending habits so now we've kind of built up this little pot of cash but you know, it's just sat there and it's in a bank account that's not earning very much money. You know, what should I be doing with it? How should we be looking at our long-term savings? And should we be changing something about our pension? Do we keep building that little pot of cash and look at buying a buy to let and getting into property? Or, you know, how does someone kind of begin to get into like buying stocks and shares and getting a bit more adventurous with their investments and their cash? Well, that's how we can help. We hope. We paired you up with Andrew Schooler, independent financial advisor, and he's based in Aberdeen. And he's been supporting couples just like you for many, many years. Let's hear what happened. When we're looking at putting plans together, I tend to work on a three-pot strategy with clients. So pot one is your day-to-day spending money. That's your current account. You keep whatever balance you need in a current account. Pot two is an emergency fund. So an emergency fund is basically where you go when a big bill comes in. Now, I've got clients that keep £5,000 in an emergency fund. I've got clients that keep £250,000 in an emergency fund. The key is, is what they are comfortable with. Some people say three months salary. Some people say six months salary a year salary personally i'll have my own opinions for my situation <laughs> you'll have a completely different view on that side of things so normally recommend it being a cash-based savings account interestingly where should i put my emergency funds because the bank are doing absolutely nothing at the moment with regards to interest <laughs> yep, tell me about it <laughs> i'm a big fan of premium bonds there isn't any risk attached to it because let's be honest you're not getting any interest on a savings account anyway but you've got the potential for greater returns so if you hold the full amount you should be getting a 25 pound check every month which actually does mean it's a reasonable interest rate i think it works out about one one point eight percent i think that's a great option to look at once the emergency fund is full leave it alone don't need to add anything more to that unless your situation changes plow everything that you are wanting to save into pot three long-term savings so that is pensions that's investments whether it be investment isas bonds general investment accounts other things as well buy to let properties shares etc these are all classified as long-term savings so you don't need to go all in on one area you can split the money between all different types of plans and i always recommend that if you're going to be saving on a regular basis you get that set up so as soon as you get paid straight out the money's <laughs> distributed to the different accounts and you said you've got emergency funds already in place is that right yeah we've got kind of what i'd say feels probably too much in that sort of short-term cash fund at the moment and where we're probably where i'm not as confident anyway is how to how to push that into more the medium to longer term you know how much is it safe to release and let go of actually and put a bit of faith into it still being there and playing out in the long term let's speak about the pros and cons of different products let's start off with investment isas for example so that's always the first place that's free investment it's free from all forms of taxation 
capital gains tax, income tax, dividend tax. The only tax that's not free from is inheritance tax. That's a whole other conversation. So <laughs> right. uh, you can put £20,000 a year into an ISA. So it's a very generous allowance. And that's each. So £40,000 total. So that can be done as a lump sum. It can also be done as a regular savings and you're never tied into a specific amount. If you want to change it going forward, absolutely fine. Another benefit of an investment ISA is it's accessible. And you can access money from an investment ISA anytime you want. I would always say it's one of the last place you go, but in an emergency, any money that you've saved into an investment ISA, you can take out. Investment ISAs, really accessible, but you've mm-hmm. still got the potential for growth. Now, there is a myriad of different ways that an investment ISA can be set up. When we look at specifics, we go through an attitude to risk, we go through a capacity for loss with clients. And that really yeah. determines how we should be investing money for clients, whether you're from very cautious to very adventurous and highly speculative. Yeah. From my perspective, Amy is the financial powerhouse in our relationship, <laughs> as in I trust Amy's decisions when she spends a lot of time explaining them to me but at the same time i'm probably a little bit more risk averse than i think what amy would be and i think amy might even say the opposite i wouldn't even buy a lottery ticket because i think that's a waste of money but i'd rather put that into premium bonds because i'm a nerd (laughs) you get your money back exactly you're gonna get your money back whereas dan would buy a lottery ticket and go play blackjack and i would think that's a waste of money But as the two just changed over the years, where once upon a time yeah. there was zero long term yeah. planning uh, from my perspective, medium to me was in three months' time as opposed to <laughs> anything longer. So, just to give you a really very quick story, Amy and I went to Vegas on our honeymoon. The most we ever spent was £10 on a blackjack machine, and we were very happy that we took $11 out of it. For me, I think it's being new to it, and we've only got a small amount of our savings already in, and I said, because of that reason, right? I would say I'm comfortable. I understand that the stock market's going to go up and down, but look how much it's moved in the last two years since the pandemic. And so it's really hard to build that trust to know, okay, if I really do put a little bit more into it, you know, what if it drops 10% overnight, 15%, having the trust that it's going to recover whilst you might know it and the logic is there and and you know we've seen it over time we're not experienced in it so that's what probably makes me nervous the fact versus kind of heart <laughs> first off r- risk is subjective everybody has a different view on risk and risk changes as well there's a thing that we assess with clients is that's called capacity for loss so what impact is your pension going down in value by 10 percent in one year going to have to you right now And the answer to that is very little because you've got time ahead of you to recoup those losses. Now, we're in an interesting period at the moment. There's a lot going on within the markets. Will there be a recovery? History has told us there will be a recovery, but depending on how big the drop is, depends on how long that recovery takes. So for someone who is investing a lump sum, they will see the value of their investments or their pensions going up and down on a daily basis. If somebody's looking at it daily, it can be quite a dangerous thing because they're then seeing, oh my goodness, I've dropped £10,000 in three days. And it's like, well, you haven't actually lost that money. The value has just gone down. You've lost the money if you're in cash at that point in time. It's gaining the trust of the markets and how things are invested. That is my question, really, is that we've probably got 30 odd years ahead of us. And at the moment, you know, we do make the most of trying to put into our employer pension, but it's just sat on the default at the moment. So whatever our employer has chosen for our pension is what we're getting. As Amy said, we've got, uh, unfortunately, 30 something years probably left of working. But we obviously want that to make the most amount of money that we possibly can over that period of time. This is where somebody like myself comes into play. I assess a client's risk profile and then I would advise clients on how funds should be invested. So if somebody is 
an adventurous investor, for example, the majority of their money is going to be in the stock market. So it's going to be invested in equities. That isn't just UK based, it's worldwide. If someone's more cautious, we will see less equity investment. So the percentage holders will reduce and then we'll see more stability elements. So these are things like bonds and gilt. So loans to large corporations and governments. You may even see some commodities coming in there. Classic is gold, you know, stock market goes down price of gold goes up that's always tends to what's happened in the past cash foreign exchange comes into those portfolios as well so risk profiles can change i have taken the leap and kind of gone in and we've got an online portal where i can see my works pension and i can do one of those sort of like little quizzes like you mentioned andrew and assess your risk profile but then it opens up but maybe 250 different funds that i can choose from and that in itself is too many for me to look at and feel confident in like choosing the same one many of them have the same risk profile how do you know which one's better than another so if a client's doing it themselves or a famous doing it herself i would always tend to go for a multi-asset portfolio so that you're getting a bit of everything and then you can experiment with funds here and there that's an option you know the risk profile you know the risk of the funds because your pension provider will tell you that and you can make that decision at that point in time. That was going to be one of my questions was one of the options I know we have is that you can just say I want, you know, 50% to go into the medium risk and I want 50% to go into the high risk and you sort of play with that. Does splitting it in that way, does that kind of make it redundant that you've chosen one that's high and one that's medium? I'm not a fan of that approach, I'll be honest with you. I much prefer to say, well, okay, let's say you are a 7 out of 10 moderately adventurous investor. The portfolio that you would be looking at that's risk profile to that attitude to risk is got the medium risk elements in it is got the high risk elements in it if you're using other risk profile portfolios you're actually just pulling your risk profile down or up that's definitely been sort of how I've looked at it and gone, oh, well, that, would that soften the blow? You know, if I only put half of it into the high risk one, would I protect myself because I've got half still in the safe one? There's two sides to that argument. Yeah, absolutely. It could soften you against losses, but it'll also soften you against potential gains as well yeah, sure because you don't have the exposure to the stock market yeah. that you would have done. So, Which uh, is defeating the purpose. We've just said, you know, yeah. put it in and I've got 10 years to wait. That's okay. That's action number one for me. <laughs> Can I go log in now? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so that approach is for your pensions. It can also be an approach for regular savings into an ISA, etc. And I think with your pension, that does feel like the one that's more comfortable maybe trialing some of that risk with because you know that you're not going to get to touch it anyway right even with you know even if I wanted to I'm not going to be able to take that out for another 20 years so one of the other things that we've been debating so, is whether or not actually we should be sort of saving up pot that we've got at the moment and instead of putting it into our ISA instead maybe looking at a property and a buy to let and the house prices around us just seem to kind of be skyrocketing at the same time as I'm watching but the small amount that I've got in my ISA fall. What are your thoughts? Is there a benefit to property versus stocks and shares? Dan, what are your thoughts on property? I have mixed feelings on it, if I'm brutally honest. Mm. An ideal dream would be that you could own second or even multiple properties if you had the cash to do it, earn an income from it. But I guess my understanding of, of doing that probably isn't fantastic. And so I guess for me, it feels like a lot of money spent potentially, to not have much of a return on what you're getting I for it. I think Dan also knows that he would be the one that's going to be sent to fix the plumbing. And... <laughs> 100%. Uh, so from my perspective, I would 100% be in there day in and day out working on a house that I won't live in. <laughs> First of all, you've got to think about how are you going to finance the purchase of the property? Is it going to be done 100% in cash? Are you going to be using all your savings to then purchase the property? Or are you putting down a deposit and then taking out a mortgage to finance it? Is there a natural almost yes, no, even at that decision point? Like if you're going to have to get a mortgage, does that kind of mean, do you know what, you're going to erode the earnings so much that you're that's not on the table. No, not at all. Some people look at it as leveraging their savings. Let's say 
property costs £100,000 and you have £20,000 in savings. So basically you're leveraging your £20,000 by getting a mortgage of £80,000 to then buy the property. It's then let out. So what you need to think of is a buy-to-let property, whether it's one, two, three, four, or 15, you're running Whoa, 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 calm down. We're, 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 we're trying to get onto when at the moment. <laughs> we're winning, Andrew. You and I are the same mind. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. So you need to think of it running like a business because effectively that's what you're doing. Rental income comes in and you are going to pay income tax on that rental income. If you are getting a thousand pounds a month income if you're a higher rate taxpayer 40 percent of that is going to go in tax and if you live in scotland that's 41 percent that you're paying in tax so straight away that thousand pounds income has dropped down to 600 pounds from that 600 pounds you still have to pay the mortgage you still have to pay the insurances the upkeep all the other expenses that come out so a lot of people look at the rental income and think brilliant that's great but hang on there's a lot of deductions that then come off that to before it actually goes in your pocket and that's where i'm sat andrew so you front x amount of cash to get a mortgage you then have to invest in the property to get someone attracted to come in to rent it from you at that point our savings has taken a massive hit at which point then we rent it out but your return on what you'll get in income from a rental may be nothing you may just net out one thing to bear in mind depending on how you've set up your mortgage that rental income that you're getting net of tax is hopefully paying the mortgage back so over 25 years or however long you've taken it out you then own that asset outright without any borrowing so it's a way to think that your tenants are actually paying for your mortgage they are actually investing the money for you and then you've got the asset at the end property prices should in theory go up as well so not only are you seeing the loan or the £80,000, let's say, in this situation being repaid over 20 years, you're also seeing a capital increase in value of the property. That's a rose-tinted view on things. And, <laughs> you know, if you watch Homes Under the Hammer and or any of that side of things, you'll see everybody ploughing into property. The darker side of that is if the property isn't let out, you're not getting any income coming in, but you still have to pay your mortgage. You still have to pay the council tax. You still have to pay the insurances. And property prices can go down in value. It happens. Some people say property is a no-risk investment. There is as many risks with property as there is with investments. But all your eggs are in one basket with property. You are 100% reliant on that doing well, that being let out, capital growth and having good tenants. If that all works out, brilliant. A lot of people have profited a lot from property and they see it as that's the route they want to go down. But it's a very narrow view when it comes to investments. That's helpful. Thank you. And we overpay on our mortgage at the moment. So if we didn't overpay on our mortgage, for example, and put that into savings. Again, is there a better choice there? We could put it into our ISA or we could put that away so that eventually that does become enough savings to buy a second property. Making overpayments in the mortgage is a great idea because you know an investment would then need to perform above that level for there to be a benefit for you. We've always got to look at what you're paying on interest in the mortgage compared to what an investment could do. Now, a lot of people will say, yeah, 100%, put the money into an investment over the medium to long term, you will get a better return than you're going to be paying interest on a mortgage. There are no guarantees in life. By not paying into the mortgage and let's say paying into an investment, yes, absolutely, it could perform at a far higher rate than the interest. And then you can use that lump sum either to pay down some of your mortgage when your fixed rate comes up. You could say, well, you know what, I'm happy with a 25 year term on my mortgage because you know what well, it's affordable i'm comfortable with it my priority is i want another property or i want more money in savings that then i have flexibility to 
retire early. So it, it all comes down to what your objectives and what your priorities are really going forward with savings. Oh, I was going to say, oh, oh second property. Absolutely. <laughs> so we keep 15 me. properties <laughs> down the line and you've got a nice little income coming in and that's your It's funny how we circle back to that. I think hey, uh, so you got him to say it. <laughs> so much take home from that um, and, but I want to go to you Amy what was the main thing that you took away from your time with Andrew yeah my big takeaway from Andrew is taking that confidence into the long-term investment you know as long as we're comfortable putting that money away for the next 10-15 years and that sounds a long time but actually Maya's only two so that you know that only just sort of gets her to uni potentially and if we have that in mind then that's a long enough time to be quite comfortable letting that money sit somewhere else and don't watch it you know going up and down and don't think of it as a bit of gambling as I might have done in the past that actually it's kind of in safe hands in those accounts. Yeah I would agree I think there's definitely stuff for us to build on in that because we I've thought Amy might have been in terms of her attitude to risk and where mine is we probably meet in the middle a bit more than I thought we did but that will help us make I guess decisions moving down the road so that's I think it's been really helpful for that for me I'd gone from hiding away from debt to looking at what does savings look like for the short to medium term to now look at well what does my retirement look like and I think for us we've got time on our side to use to use to our advantage Angelica, these are words I never would have thought I would hear Dan say seven years ago. <laughs> I know. Amy, I'm glad that I could be part of this experience and hear it too. <laughs> but I think it was fascinating to hear what kinds of options are open to you and get an insight into what might be the best way forward. Amy and Dan, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. And the best of luck for next steps as well. Thanks very Pick much. Thank you very much. Um, it sounds like you're in a great position to create the brightest financial future you can. So, And send my love to Maya well as well. Thank you. <laughs> we will. Thank you. I'm sure you'll agree that Amy and Dan's story is quite an inspiring one. And like me, you're pretty impressed at the discipline they showed. But it's all paid off for them. So what are the key things to think about when you've managed to get yourself into a stronger position financially and you're looking to make the best of your money? Well, to give us some general pointers, I'm joined now by Matt Frain, who is a director at Legal and General Financial Advice. Hello, Matt. So what do you think are key points we can learn from Amy and Dan's story? So uh, Amy and Dan have done a great job in building up their savings. I think it's incredibly powerful given where they started from with the debt that had been built up initially I think it's a really powerful story now there were lots and lots of different areas covered during that discussion and I actually thought that the financial advisor Andrew did a fantastic job in explaining the various options that Amy and Dan have available to them I'm just going to draw out a few key points and the first one that I think is the number one priority for people in Amy and Dan's position or similar positions is to seek the right help and advice from experts There are many, many different ways to get help and advice, many different sources. Some are close to hand, so you may have your employer, your workplace pension provider, your insurance company, your bank, your solicitor, your accountant, lots of these people who will be able to help you out with certain aspects. But then there are other things like free guidance services. One of the better known ones is Money Helper, and they can provide information across a wide range of topics from the likes of state benefits, budgeting, money concerns, right through to the likes of pensions, investments and and house purchases. So they can offer a a really wide range of uh, help and support there. And someone like Money Helper can be a really useful source of information to people who have debt problems. And they can also give you advice and support and tell you where to go for free debt advice or access to a, a free debt advisor. And then going beyond those sort of guided services, there are, of course, financial advisors that people can turn to. So if you're looking for a personalised recommendation based around your individual circumstances, then I would suggest seeking out a financial advisor locally to you. And if you don't already have one, you can source one from websites such as unbiased.co.uk. OK, let's move on to another point and talk about inflation, because it does impact our lives in loads of different ways, but especially savings, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And inflation erodes your savings, it erodes your real returns, and current rates of inflation are sitting around 9%, forecasted by most to go into double figures at some point later on in this year. So it's really impacting people. We can feel it when we go to the supermarkets, and we can certainly see it at the petrol pumps right now. So 
it's really important that people initially work out how much they need as cash holdings that emergency fund that safety net and any short-term planned expenditure so you may be i don't know planning to buy a new car in the next couple of years you might be planning some home improvements things that you need readily accessible cash for but when you have that cash held it's so important that you shop around to make sure that any cash savings you do have are getting the highest interest rates possible what i would always say to people in short we all work really hard to earn our money so you need to make sure that that money's also working hard for you and what should people consider if they're looking for the long term for some returns and some investments yeah this is probably more important than ever right now with the inflationary environment we're in so above and beyond those emergency funds and short-term cash holdings that people need any excess cash savings people should really consider investing them looking at at things like ISAs or pensions and and where they can invest it to potentially beat inflation so whilst there are investment risks to consider and investments aren't for everyone Over the long term, pensions investments have historically provided greater returns than cash and alongside property are arguably your best option in combating inflation. Plus, the financial advisor Andrew mentioned there are many tax benefits with the likes of pensions and investment ISAs. An obvious one, a big one, is tax relief that you get on pension contributions. All of those tax benefits can make a really big difference to the net returns that you receive, so people should be looking to take advantage of those. And then finally, the final point I would make around investing, it's a common misconception that it's the domain of the wealthy. It's for, you know, the rich of society only. However, stocks and shares ISIS, for example, can often be opened with as little as £100 as a single lump sum or just £20 a month as a contribution. And likewise, pensions will usually accept relatively small monthly contributions into them. So these products are very much available to all And I would encourage everyone to try and take advantage of of them whenever possible. So what you're saying basically, Matt, is if you have savings and they're not doing anything for you, it's worth looking at other options and getting a financial advisor um, who has your best interests at heart to look at other things you can do to make your money work. Absolutely, Angelica. Well, Matt, thank you so much. And of course, a big thank you to Amy and Dan for sharing their financial lows and highs. And wherever you are in life, you can find lots more resources and information on Legal and General's website. Just go to legalandgeneral.com. You'll also see details of the free midlife MOT course, which they produced with the Open University. It'll give you the tools you need to plan your future wealth, work and well-being. I'm Angelica Bell, and I'll be back soon with more people looking for answers to their financial questions, more experts who can help them, and I hope some more insight just right for you. Follow this podcast on your favourite platform, and I'll catch you then.